This week on the Green Left News podcast, Palestinian revolutionary Leila Khaled is speaking in Borloo, Perth at Eco-Socialism 2024. Ten women have been killed by gender-based violence this year and the asbestos scandal striking Sydney. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. another week bringing you the latest news this time with green left journalist anisa Banji. hi isaac thanks for having me today you're welcome and we'll kick it off this week with eco socialism 2024 which is a conference coming up in borloo or perth in western australia uh, which will be an invaluable opportunity to share experiences with activists from around the indian ocean and discuss how we can collectively campaign against war and climate catastrophe now, Green Left is proud to host this conference with support from Socialist Alliance and Lynx International Journal of Socialist Renewal. And the theme this year is Fight Climate Change, Not War. The conference will be taking place at the Borloo Activist Centre from Friday, June 28 to Sunday, June 30. And there'll be a range of representatives from socialist and progressive organisations in Pakistan, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore and India, as well as activists from a range of campaigns across Australia. Solidarity with Palestine will be a strong feature at the conference with iconic Palestinian revolutionary activist Leila Khaled to address the conference. Khaled is a national committee member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, or PFLP, a socialist organization that advocates for the creation of a democratic, secular Palestine. Khaled is also a PFLP representative on the Palestine National Council which is the legislative body of the Palestine Liberation Organization. And Green Left's Peter Boyle spoke to Khaled last week. Uh, now it's time for people who demonstrated in support of uh, the Palestinians and the, uh, the atrocities that Israel is doing for them. Now they have to pressure their country, their governments, like in Australia, they, they are supporting Israel. Uh, the attitude of the Australian government uh, and the other countries who are still saying that Israel has the right to defend itself. But Israel is not defending now. It's attacking all the time for four months. You can listen to that full interview on the podcast feed or watch the video on the Green Left website. Perhaps predictably, however, the establishment media has gone into meltdown over the idea of Leila Khaled speaking at the conference or even coming to Australia. Eco-Socialism 2024 organiser Sam Wainwright said the far-right objections to even allowing Khaled to address the gathering is fake outrage. He told Green Left that achieving justice for the Palestinian people in accordance with international law and multiple United Nations resolutions is more than just an area of interest for Khaled. It has been her life's work. He said there is a very direct connection between this objective and preventing catastrophic runaway global warming. While the establishment media is fear-mongering about the plane hijackings Carla did more than 50 years ago and labelling her a terrorist, Wainwright pointed to the Good Friday Agreement, which brought together armed groups in Northern Ireland, and the fact that many Western governments described the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela as terrorists. He also pointed out that warmongers like former Prime Minister John Howard, who authorised the country to participate in the illegal invasion of Iraq, which led to the deaths of a million people, still get a platform on mainstream media channels. He said Khaled's participation in our conference will amplify a voice that points to a path for peace with justice for all those living in Palestine and Israel. <laughs> The 
movement for Palestine is still going strong as tens of thousands took action again on the weekend to demand Australia stop supporting Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza. Anger at Labor for refusing to take a stand was as strong as ever at the 22nd weekend march in Gadigal, Sydney on February 25. And Green Senator David Shoebridge highlighted Foreign Minister Penny Wong's brazen lying about Australia's arms exports to Israel. Without Australian parts, those Israeli fighter jets could not fly and bomb Palestine, but Australia continues to send them and build them and produce them. Uh, DFAT foreign affairs official figures show more than $10 million of arms and ammunition exports to Israel in the last five years. More than 350 weapons export permits granted. On February 23, a protest was held outside the Office of Federal Environment Minister Tanya Pluvasek, pointing out that there is no environmental justice under occupation. And rally co-chair Yana Fayed said the Israeli government has manufactured an environmental disaster as well as a human one. Speakers encourage people to join the picket outside Anthony Albanese's office in Marrickville, which is still going strong after more than two weeks. They are asking volunteers for volunteers, so please go down and join the picket or email familiesforpalestine at gmail.com to join the roster. In Corner Yerta, Adelaide on February 25 was the 10th fortnightly protest outside South Australia's Parliament House calling for an immediate end to the genocide and marching through the city centre. And in Parramatta in Western Sydney, protesters gathered outside Labor MP Andrew Charlton's office on February 24, demanding he speak out for Palestine. Speakers said Charlton had betrayed his election promise to listen to and represent the local community. There was an electric atmosphere at the rally in Nam, Melbourne, on February 25, as protesters demanded hands off Rafa. They called for the Victorian government to end its partnership with Israeli weapons manufacturer Elbit Systems. And the weekly rally in Nipaluna, or Hobart, heard from independent MP Andrew Wilkie, who's recently returned from a trip to Britain to support Julian Assange's case, as well as Irish Tasmanian Gerard, as well as Irish Tasmanian Gerard O'Sullivan, who drew parallels between the history of Ireland and Palestine. In Borlu, a Gaza pilgrimage for peace was held on February 24, with participants walking 31 kilometres, the distance from Gaza City to Rafa from Sorrento to Walyalup Fremantle. The walk was organised by Palestinian Christian groups. And in Mianjin, or Brisbane, a protest was held outside Treasurer Jim Chalmers' office, with the march beginning at Rowan Park, with a banner-making session for children. The powerful new documentary Palestine Under Siege was screened across the country over February 24 to 25 at sessions organised by Green Left, Socialist Alliance and Dare to Struggle Film Festival. The film follows former Green Senator Lee Rhiannon, Palestinian-Australian Rand Darwish and anti-Zionist Jewish activist Dr. Peter Slezak on a trip to the West Bank and East Jerusalem over June to July last year, as well as covering parts of the huge solidarity movement that broke out after October 7. Filmmakers Jill Hickson and John Reynolds from Dare to Struggle Film Festival made the documentary as a resource for the Palestinian solidarity movement and to delve deeper into the struggle by Palestinians for their self-determination. At screenings in Gadigal, Molibimba, Newcastle, Gimoy, Cairns and Borlu, Hickson and Reynolds hosted questions and answer sessions discussing the situation in Palestine and the next steps for the solidarity movement internationally. And Trade Unionists for Palestine hosted a forum on February 16, which discussed workers' right to stand in solidarity with Palestine in their workplaces. Dr. Rita Almodi, who's from Australian and New Zealand Doctors for Palestine, spoke alongside Mariam Chekchok, uh, who's from Teachers and School Staff for Palestine, and Violet Ayad, who's a Palestinian Lebanese Australian actor and member of the Media Entertainment Arts Alliance. Uh, and Al Moti reported that doctors were being told not to discuss genocide in their workplaces. She said approximately 39 doctors have been reported to the Australian Health Practitioner Regulatory Agency. And Chekchok said many teachers have been bullied at work for speaking out about Palestine. Uh, and at the forum, a motion was passed calling on unions to defend workers' rights to support Palestine, uh, organise a National Day of Action, and remove restrictions on the right to strike, support the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign, and build the weekly Palestine rallies.
advocates and support services continue to demand urgent action and early intervention to stop high rates of domestic and gender-based violence against women. Data from the activists at Destroy the Joint show that a staggering 64 women were killed last year. That's an average of more than one woman a week. As of February 28, 10 women have lost their lives as a result of gender-based violence this year alone. The National Homicide Monitoring Program reported that 50% of adult female victims were killed by a current or former partner. Many domestic violence survivors are unable to leave violent homes, with the New South Wales Council of Social Service estimating in October that almost 5,000 women are stuck in violent homes, 2,402 women were forced to return to a violent partner, and 2,410 were homeless after fleeing violence. Shamefully, more than half of those trying to access the federal government's outsourced escaping violence payment were unable to do so, with more than half of claims rejected. And parks, supermarkets, several schools and a hospital across Gadigal, Sydney, were fenced off with bright yellow and orange webbing as asbestos was found in mulch laid around the sites. The number of asbestos polluted sites around the city is growing by the day, with many places forced to close for weeks while the deadly substance is removed. Asbestos leads to asbestosis or lung cancer, and asbestos was even found in the brand new children's playground in the middle of the giant tollway road interchange at Roselle, which is part of the West Connex network. The Guardian uncovered documents proving that the New South Wales Environment Protection Authority has known about the contamination risk of mulch supplied by these for-profit corporate recycling companies for more than a decade, but failed to act. It actually abandoned a proposal to tighten regulations in 2022 after pushback, pushback from the industry and negative media coverage. And even now, one of the companies alleged to be responsible for the asbestos contamination is taking legal action to prevent the EPA from stopping it from distributing more of the suspect material. Adrian Barugaba, Wangan and Jagalingu cultural custodian, has filed a case against the Queensland government in the Supreme Court to prevent the destruction of the Dung Mabula Springs. Barugaba said traditional owners have identified threats of serious environmental harm to the Dung Mabula Springs complex, the site of immense spiritual, cultural and environmental value for us. Our connection to country depends on conservation, maintenance and protection of the significant sacred site. Cultural custodians asked Queensland Supreme Court to intervene after the government refused to suspend operations at the Adani, Bravis Carmichael coal mine. They are arguing that the decision is inconsistent with the state's Human Rights Act, which recognises the right of Indigenous people to conserve and protect the environment and productive capacity of their land, territories and waters. Parents for Climate held a solidarity action on February 19 outside Santos's new shopfront in Smith Street Mall in Garamilla or Darwin in solidarity with the Tiwi Islanders fighting to preserve culturally significant sea country and to protect the environment from fossil fuel exploitation. Similar actions were organised across the country as well as in Japan, South Korea and Canada in response to Tiwi Islanders' calls for a global day of action against Santos's Barossa gas project. Santos wants to drill underwater gas wells and lay 262 kilometers of pipeline in the Timor Sea. It will be laid through a protected marine park and along the entire length of one of the Tiwi Islands, coming within seven kilometers at its closest point. Despite the record heat conditions, more than 100 people protested outside the headquarters of Woodside on February 20. Disrupt Burrup Hub is campaigning against Woodside's proposed browse gas expansion of the Burrup in the Pilbara region. After hearing from a number of speakers, protesters engaged in a sit-down which led to a number of arrests. Hundreds attended Geelong Rainbow's annual Pride March on February 17, which was followed by a festival celebrating LGBTIQ performers. Both events showcased the strength and diversity of the LGBTIQ community, 
And the event was opened by Sarah Hathaway, who's a Socialist Alliance Geelong councillor, who called on people to sign a petition urging council to implement the Victorian government's Rainbow Ready Roadmap. In a tragic and shocking story, Sydney couple Luke Davies and Jesse Baird were allegedly murdered by New South Wales police officer Bo Lamar Condon last week with his police-issued handgun. Lamar had previously been filmed aggressively tasering a man in 2020. In response to the killing, Mardi Gras has blocked New South Wales police from marching at the annual parade on March 2. A New South Wales police officer has also been charged with the dangerous driving occasioning death and negligent driving occasioning death by the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions after he collided with 16-year-old Jai Kalani Wright, who was riding a push bike on February 20, 2022. And the family of the Dungadi teenager have welcomed the news with his parents Lachlan Wright and Kylie Aloha saying, we are emotional and relieved that charges have been laid. It's been two years without our vibrant, beautiful son beside us. He was a funny, witty, and loved by so many people. Jai is one of at least 558 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have died in custody and police operations since the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. And only one of the Royal Commission's 339 recommendations have been implemented, and police have almost never been held accountable. Activists and community members celebrated the founding of the Chilean Communist Party at an event in Fairfield, Western Sydney, on February 17. Artistic and cultural activities were enjoyed by representatives of communist parties from Latin America, Iraq, Iran, and a number of Asian and Australian communist parties, as well as the Socialist Alliance. Palestinian-Australian Khaled Ghanam, who spoke on behalf of the Socialist Alliance, paid tribute to the common struggle across Latin America and Palestine for self-determination. He added that the Palestinian revolution had learned from the Latin American revolutions and that Palestine sees itself as part of the people's struggle against tyranny and racism. Ukrainian community members and supporters rallied across the country to commemorate the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion and Ukraine's ongoing resistance. In Gadigal, they gathered outside St. Mary's Cathedral on February 24, beginning with a minute's silence for those who have died resisting Russian aggression. Speakers pointed out that Russia thought it could take Ukraine in 10 days, but two years later, Ukraine is still standing. More than 100 people joined the rally at Murray Street Mall in Borloo the same day, with members of the Ukrainian community addressing the crowd and urging Australia's government to continue supporting them in the fight against Russia's occupation. In Corner Yurta, a solemn but defiant protest was organised by the Ukrainian community on the steps of Parliament House on February 22, and two representatives from the 400 Ukrainian refugees in South Australia spoke about their uncertain future. There were also rallies held in Nam and Ngunnawal or Canberra. Representatives of more than 30 community organisations met on February 3 to discuss working more closely to oppose AUKUS and the US-Australian war drive against China. They also endorsed the Marrickville Declaration, which highlights the dangers of the AUKUS alliance and commits signatories to campaign to force Labour to withdraw from it. The declaration also opposes spending $368 billion on nuclear submarines instead of urgent social, environmental and community needs. It calls on signatories to oppose AUKUS through non-violent means and to promote peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region. It calls on Labour to reveal the full details of the AUKUS agreement, including its purpose, timing and cost. Amnesty International Australia and refugee rights groups said that the 40 people who recently sought asylum in Western Australia and have been since taken to the Nauru Offshore Detention Centre for Processing should be brought back here. Graham Tom, who's Amnesty International Australia spokesperson, said on February 19 that Labor must listen to the human rights experts, medical professionals, legal advocates and the majority of the Australian public who denounce offshore detention as being unsafe, inhumane and unacceptable. He said, Detaining asylum seekers offshore is a dead-end policy of cruelty. After 10 years, hundreds of people who sought asylum in Australia suffer irreparable damage 
from their time on Nauru and Manus. The Refugee Council of Australia wants a royal commission into Australia's detention regime and is supporting independent MP Kylie Tink's Migration Amendment Limits on Immigration Detention Bill, which it said provides a clear path forward in ensuring that detention is only used when necessary and for the shortest time possible. A vigil was held to commemorate one of the victims of the offshore processing system in Nam on February 16. Iranian Kurdish refugee Reza Barati was murdered by guards at the Australian-run detention centre on Manus Island in 2014. Barati was one of many refugees who have died as a result of Australia's cruel refugee policies, including detention, boat turnbacks and deportation, which have led to murder, medical neglect or suicide. Now let's hear what's been happening around the world. Thousands marched from the Royal Courts of Justice to the British Prime Minister's Downing Street office on February 21 to protest the extradition of Julian Assange to danger in the United States. Assange's legal team is seeking approval from the court to appeal an earlier court decision to extradite Assange to the US. Assange is the founder of WikiLeaks, which exposed numerous U.S. war crimes, including collateral murder, which showed U.S. soldiers deliberately and callously murdering unarmed Iraqi civilians and journalists. If extradited to the U.S., Assange faces prosecution under the Anti-Democratic Espionage Act and could face 175 years in prison. The U.S. has attempted to murder Assange while he was in prison, which his team presented evidence of. Assange was too ill to attend the court hearing. Green Left journalist Kamala Emanuel was outside the court hearing. Pretty grim. People are saying that, that he's so unwell, they're, they're killing him. So, so things are pretty dire, actually. And while it's great to have this turnout here today, um, and, and there are a couple of um, trade union banners here today, which I, I didn't see yesterday, have got to be concerned about how much... Well, there's, you know, there is attention on what's going on, and, and it is clear if you're paying attention that this, is, this whole thing is a farce, it's a travesty, there's no such thing as justice. The court is not expected to issue a determination before March. Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva told reporters at the African Union Summit in Ethiopia on February 18 that what is happening in the Gaza Strip isn't war, it's a genocide. His comments come amid Israel's ongoing assault that's killed about 30,000 Palestinians since October 7. And he's also taken aim at Western countries that cut funding to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA. He said Israel's accusation that some UNRWA employees were involved in the October 7 attack was no excuse to paralyze UNRWA and called on countries to follow Brazil's lead in increasing their contributions to the agency. Lula also used the opportunity to reiterate his call for Palestine to be definitively recognized as a full and sovereign state. In response, Israel has declared Lula persona non grata, and Brazil's foreign minister has recalled the country's ambassador from Tel Aviv. Brazil's radical left Socialism and Freedom Party have come out strongly in support of Lula's actions and said more direct measures should be taken, such as breaking off all diplomatic and economic relations, as well as trade and military agreements. 25 years ago, on February 15, 1999, the Kurdish people's leader Abdullah Öcalan was abducted in a NATO-orchestrated operation. Despite this, and from prison on Imrali Island, Öcalan has become a symbol and an effective actor for progressive change in the Middle East. His freedom would have wider implications, including freedom for other political prisoners and a boost for the democratic and revolutionary changes that have already been brought about by people in Rojava. And high in the Peruvian Andes lies a brown treeless mountain top the scars of the now boarded up Santa Barbara mercury mine. The mine was once the epicenter of mercury production in the Spanish colonial empire, and its legacy is social and environmental devastation. Spanish colonizers learned the location of rich deposits of cinnabar, which is heated to yield mercury in the late 1500s, and they used it to refine ore into silver allowing the production of silver coins, which became a global currency for trade. 
Indigenous people from communities up to hundreds of kilometres away were forced to work at the mine, many dying on the journey there due to exhaustion, lack of food and freezing conditions. More died from the brutal labour and unsafe working conditions at the mine or from mercury poisoning, silicosis or mine collapses. And as life expectancy once you started working at the mine was only about two years. By the 1600s, Santa Barbara was known as La Mina de la Muerte, or the Mine of Death. It continued operation at a reduced scale after Peruvian independence in the early 1800s, and then finally closed for good in the 1970s. The site is still one of the world's most mercury-contaminated urban areas and has significant health impacts on nearby residents, including high rates of stillbirths. The Peruvian government has failed to respond to the urgent need for remediation despite the grave health problems facing thousands of people. You can read more about all of the stories we talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a Greenleft supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2024 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate, and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. Your support is greatly appreciated. As always, you can head to our activist calendar at greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find out about upcoming protests, rallies, forums, cultural events, and more happening in your town and city. Thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music that you heard in this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Greenleft Online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.